we, uh, we were cut off. Maybe it was God's sovereign blessing so that I would uh, make the break when we were supposed to take the break. Or maybe one of you contrived to sabotage my internet connection temporarily. But anyway, uh, did your internets go off too or it was just mine? Just mine. I think it was just yours. Just yours. Yeah. Sorry. Hey. All right, so back to screen share and back to PowerPoint. So nothing being impossible. Uh, it was an image used for unimaginably great engineering projects and all sorts of stuff. It just, just was an image for what was virtually impossible, humanly speaking, although it was often used in connection with what actually happened. It was virtually impossible. But anyway, the expression is used in the Old Testament for God's sovereignty over creation. God is the one who moves mountains, usually in the connection with judgment in the Old Testament. Here, presumably, it's acting as God's agent. Prophetically inspired speech, like in Ezekiel, prophesied to the mountains of Israel, and so on. <clears throat> and if one doesn't doubt in one's heart, now, when you start thinking about it, and you think, am I doubting? It tends to lead towards you doubting. But that's probably missing the point of, of what it's about. Diocrino normally means to make a distinction or discriminate. It's used for distrust versus faith in a couple times elsewhere in the New Testament. <clears throat> How does a semantic range centered in distinguish extend to failing to trust? I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe it's not distinguishing big things such as mountains from little things one already trusts God's, God for. That's my suggestion. If one of you has another suggestion, I'd like to get more ideas on the table so I can consider them myself, but any idea? Okay, well, when you figure it out, let me know uh, or publish an article and send it to me or whatever. <clears throat> in, in, the, in the Q parallel, in a, in a somewhat different uh, setting, he said to them, because of your little faith, this is why they couldn't cast out the the demon. Um, in Mark, it's you, you didn't pray enough or you, you're not praying right. In Matthew, because of your little faith, which is a typically Matthean way of putting things. <clears throat> For truly, I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there, it will move, nothing will be impossible for you. In Luke, faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, so back to a tree kind of thing, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. That, that works together, I think, with Mark's expression, have faith in God. The point when you put them together seems to be not how big your faith is, but how big is the God in whom is your faith? This saying is multiply attested. Mountain moving is not associated with faith in any of the other sources we know of, uh, in, in outside, the, outside the New Testament, but it's attested for Jesus in Q and in Mark, and already within 35 years, it's presupposed in 1 Corinthians 13 2, where Paul says, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, He's, he's presumably evoking a, the saying of Jesus there since we don't know of any other, any other source that associated that with faith. <clears throat> so by normal historical methods, this should be one of the most secure sayings of Jesus. But it's really debated as to what it means by this mountain. Now in 1 Corinthians 13.2, clearly Paul applies it generically. You know, you can move mountains with, with faith. Although love is more important, he emphasizes. So it fits Jesus' lesson in faith. Well, what about Jesus historically before, before it began to be applied? It's applied to a tree in Luke 17, 6. So that suggests that it's, it's generic. It can be applied to more than one thing. Um, 
<clears throat> but a mountain as something high may be compared with the sea as something low, you know, this mountain be cast into the sea. So it may be generic, a balancing of the highest thing being cast into the lowest thing, although the mountains have these deep roots below everything else. <clears throat> uh, you can contrast in, in 2 Maccabees 9.8, <clears throat> how Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes thought in his superhuman arrogance, he could command the waves of the sea, imagined he could weigh high mountains in a balance, but he was brought down to earth and carried away in a litter showing that God is really the one powerful. Yet Jesus commands the sea and empowers disciples to command mountains. He's the true and ultimate king, uh, not Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes who claimed to be the epiphany of a deity, but the one who really is the epiphany of deity. But did Jesus also make an additional application to the temple in Jerusalem like in Mark's sandwich context. Uh, some scholars have suggested a connection that this mountain refers to the Herodium, which would have been in view from where they were. <sighs> Certainly none of the gospel writers assume that their audiences would have understood that, but that's, that's one suggestion that some have made. I don't think it's very likely. <clears throat> some suggest that it refers to the Mount of Olives, now, that's not the only mountain in Mark's gospel, but it is the only mountain specifically mentioned in the context of say to this mountain be removed. The only particular one that Mark's ideal diaspora audience, most of whom had never been pilgrims to Jerusalem, would envision. Even if they had been pilgrims to Jerusalem, that's probably the one that they would envision. It's the only one specifically called a mountain. The Dead Sea could be visible from the Mount of Olives, although Mark's audience wouldn't know that. So Jesus could have had that in view, you know, the, the mountain cast into the sea. <clears throat> Some people apply it to Jerusalem or the Temple Mount, but Jerusalem is specifically distinguished from mountains in 1314, even though it's in the hill country. And Nowhere is the Temple Mount called a mount in Mark. So there's no way that Mark's audience would simply assume that that's what he's referring to. Uh, but uh, so, so if it's referring to any particular mountain in Mark, it would be the Mount of Olives. If Mark is thinking of the Temple Mount, he leaves that utterly ambiguous. But what about Jesus before Mark? Uh, here's just a picture of the Mount of Olives. Zion indeed is called a holy mountain in scripture. So people who knew scripture could know of Mount Zion as a mountain, uh, his holy mountain. Th these are just some references. Th these are just sample references. There's a lot more than that. Could the historical Jesus behind Mark have thought of the Temple Mount? Well, some argue for that and envision a reversal of Old Testament expectations. God protects Jerusalem even though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea. Psalm 46, those who trust in the Lord are, are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved. As the, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. So Mount Zion is the image of something immovable, uh, ends up being cast into the sea. But there are complications, I think, to the thesis that that's what Jesus had in view. Uh, the disciples are not called to bring judgment on Jerusalem. Indeed, they're called to forgive. And even the testimony that Jesus will destroy the temple is said to be false, not in the sense that the temple will be destroyed, because he did say that, but in the sense that Jesus will destroy it. So it's not Jesus or his followers who are responsible to destroy the temple. There's also no thought that the temple will be cast into the sea. Mark and his message highlight the temple with the sandwich structure, but Mark 
nowhere speaks of the temple as a mount, whereas you would think he might if, if that was the tradition of what Jesus meant. Furthermore, the generic sense is what fits the application and the historical outcome, saying to any mountain, this mountain, Jesus probably was referring to the Mount of Olives, uh, if he pointed to a particular mountain, is simply used generically as an illustration for the principle that even mountains can be removed, even the virtually impossible can, can be changed. Uh, I find it entertaining with the Prince of Egypt movie uh, where it says, I think in the, in the original draft of a song, uh, uh, you, uh, you, can, you can move mountains, but they changed the song after a faith leaders complained that this gave the idea it was about us rather than about God. And so they changed it to uh, mountains can be moved. <laughs> but Jesus actually said, <laughs> you can move the mountains provided your faith is in, is in God. So <laughs> they didn't, I don't know if they didn't look the verse up, but anyway, are the verb tenses temporally relevant here? And, and I'm thinking here, especially in terms of verse 24. Bistuete hate elabete kai este. Believe that you receive it, or is it believe that you did receive it? And it will be yours. It's it's an aorist indicative. Does the aorist have temporal force here? Because you know there's a debate about how often the force is temporal, how often it's something else. So uh, if it's temporal, you accept that God has decreed or granted it without having to see it come to pass first. So it's, it, it is an expression of faith, but I don't know if I wanna hang that much on an aorist tense. So we, we, faith though, I mean, if you don't have faith, you're not gonna command the mountain to be removed. If you don't have faith, maybe you're not gonna, um, yeah. I don't know that we always need to believe that God has granted our request before we can say we have we prayed with faith, because sometimes we don't know if it's God's will or not. And so in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says, if it's your will, it's not a lack of faith with which he's praying. But sometimes when we when we really feel the assurance that God is in it, then I think we ought to stand in faith. Forgive that you may be forgiven. This coheres with else, uh, other places in, in Jesus' teachings, like the Lord's Prayer, where forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who's indebted to us. Um, and the, the idea actually fits Jesus' environment, too. So in, in Sirach, uh, uh, pre-Christian Jewish wisdom, forgive your neighbor the wrong he has done. <clears throat> and then your sins will be pardoned when you pray. I have a friend who was reading Sirach and said, this is really good stuff. I don't know why this didn't make it into the canon. And I said, you know, I, I agree that most of it is really good stuff. And most of it would have worked well in the canon, but uh, I'm glad it didn't make it into the, ca in the canon because it's got some misogynistic stuff in it. So uh, there's a line in Ecclesiastes that's kind of strong, but Sirach goes beyond that. So. Um, no, Ecclesiasticus, Sirek. Mark's wording here may also, well, I don't need to go into that, uh, the pre-Mark and wording and so on, because we only have so much time. So um, Jerusalem's elite confront Jesus. He's challenged their honor by acting without the authorization of uh, their authorization in the temple. So they demand to know who authorized him. If he says God, they may contrast their own biblical authority as priests and scribes with him as an outsider of the temple. And Jesus, again, dodges the question for now. He doesn't say, my authority is from God. He puts them on the spot. Like a respectable wise sage, he riddles with a counter question. You know, the, the, the way he dodges the questions, he's not going to dodge 
at the end, you know. So are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? Yep. <laughs> but he's ready to he's ready to go to the cross at that point. This is this is before then. He still has some more teaching, still has some more training. He's still got to give the disciples his final passion prediction in the Last Supper, where he's going to explain the meaning of his death. So he's not ready <laughs> for that yet. And he gives him a counter question. Whence his authority, same place as John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was popular with the people. The Sadducees weren't popular with the people. The Pharisees were popular with the people, but not the Sadducees. So they, uh, they decide to dodge the question. He says, okay, well, then it's ethical for me to do it too. But Jesus appeals to an authority that's beyond their authority. Authority beyond the scribes in chapter one, beyond that, uh, he has authority over impure spirits in chapter one. Authority to forgive sins as the son of man of Daniel seven. And he delegates authority to his, his followers. He has authority as Lord over the Sabbath. Uh, he's gonna have authority over all the nations, Daniel seven. So Mark's audience knows the answer already where Jesus gets his authority. Jesus is from heaven and he has authority from heaven. And there's actually, it's authorized from heaven. A voice comes from heaven and says, you're my son. The next paragraph reveals Jesus' point again. He speaks of the, the vineyard's human caretakers. Now they're face to face with the heavenly owner's son who's come to claim what belongs to God. They need to give to Caesar what's Caesar's, but they need to give to God what's God's, and God has claimed the fruit of the vineyard. After that parable, they really want to kill him, and they prove his point. They want to kill the son of the vineyard's owner. They don't want to relinquish their authority to the one to whom it rightfully belongs. This is outer darkness with wailing and gnashing of teeth. And with that, I need to uh, pull up the next batch of slides. And let's see, screen share again. And uh, is screen share on? You can see the screen? Okay. And I'm gonna run through Mark 12. I'm just gonna summarize it. I hate to do that, but Jesus began speaking in parables like he often does, but remember the reason for it in Mark 4, so they may hear but not understand. They have to, on one level, they really do understand. That's why they want to kill him. On the other level, they don't understand. They don't have the understanding with faith. They have intellectual understanding, but the true understanding with our hearts means that we repent. And for them, it would have meant handing over the vineyard to the vineyard owner's son. Oh, wow. This really is God's son. Yeah, you're the Messiah. You can, you can have the, we'll give you the keys now. That's not what they do. The murderous tenants. It's true to life wherever possible. Uh, although some parts defy reality. There's no way the tenants would have thought, oh, if, if, if the heir is dead and we kill the heir, then we will inherit. That was immensely, enormously stupid. Nobody in antiquity would have thought that. There are some commentators today who think that, but there's no way. That's not how it worked. <laughs> uh, but other things, a lot of them were, were they, they, they fit. Fences often were of loosely fitted stones that would keep animals out. It could at least make it more difficult for robbers, wouldn't keep them out, but um, that's what the guard, the guard post was for. Watchmen would use a tower. Often it was a hut that doubled as a shelter at harvest, but it had a solid enough roof you could get up on it. Um, one difference between this and what's usual, um, they're lease, leasing a new vineyard to tenants rather than contract laborers. But the, uh, 
the vineyard is Israel. So the tenants here are the leaders of Israel. The oil press, the wine press, the threshing floor, all these things would be common at a farmhouse. And you can sort of see them in, the, in these charts, cistern, tower, press. Um, here's a harvest tower, like I was talking about. Often they weren't this big. This is a really significant harvest tower. Here's a wall painting from Pompeii um, depicting a tower-like dwelling. And uh, yeah, just some architectural things. Here are terraces that could be used for a vineyard. Here's a watchtower. Um, this is actually maybe similar, but this is probably nicer than most of them were in antiquity. But anyway, so Jesus is echoing Isaiah 5. Uh, it fits pretty well, the Septuagint. As Craig Evans and, and some others have pointed to parallels also with the Targum of Isaiah and the Hebrew text of Isaiah. Uh, but for simple purposes, since Mark would be using the Septuagint, uh, even though Mark doesn't specify this as a quotation from the Old Testament, people who are really familiar with the Old Testament, there's enough language loaded in the first couple verses that they, they might catch this at least sooner or later if they keep hearing scripture being read. So, <clears throat> uh, I'm actually not going to run through these for the sake of time, but you have the chart there that you can use for your own purposes if you wish someday. <clears throat> but it underlines the wickedness of the tenants because in, in Isaiah, God comes looking for the fruit and it's yielding bad fruit to him. It's not yielding good fruit. And here, Jesus is the one who comes as God's agent and it underlines the wickedness of the tenants. Smallholders predominated, but there were a lot of tenant farmers. You had clients on estates. Rabbis also told stories of, of tenant farmers working on larger estates. Some have said this is a peasant revolt and Jesus actually sides with the peasants. That's not true. Um, killing messengers was always viewed as treacherous, even when the Judean revolutionaries slaughtered the Roman soldiers in the in the fortress Antonia. Uh, it was it was an act of treachery because they promised them that they wouldn't, and then they said, "Okay, you're pagans. We don't have to keep our promise to you," and they killed him. Uh, also, this is a benevolent patron. In fact, he acts foolishly benevolent. He he, he because he he sends for I mean he he sends for the fruit of the land. So I'm not I'm not trying to sound like a capitalist. I'm not trying to sound like a landowner. Actually, I didn't have a house even until a few years ago. This is, uh, anyway. So this is, uh, yeah. Uh, I hope I don't sound bad, but anyway, it just, it wouldn't work in an ancient context. They wouldn't think of the parable this way. God appears too nice. You know, God is the is the uh, is the landowner, just like in the book of Isaiah. He appears too nice. He appears naively nice. It stretches the bounds of reality that he would say, "Oh, they didn't accept this messenger. They beat that messenger. They killed that messenger. Well, I'll send them my son because they'll surely be nice to my son." That's like that's naive. And, and God isn't naive, but it's like, I have bent over backwards to give you guys a chance. And you're still not embracing my message. It's, it's about to become too late. The temple is gonna be destroyed. It's gonna be taken, everything's gonna be taken away from you. Some landlords in antiquity, there were a lot of mean landlords. Some of them had their own hit squads. You know, uh, landlords could have slaves working in the fields. But when they had free tenants, they, they could kick them off the land and replace them with slaves. Plenty of the younger does that in, in, some of his le in one of his letters. Um, <clears throat> but they also, sometimes uh, Ramsey McMullen talks about them having hit squads to take out troublesome tenants. The son here, who is the son in this parable? 
Okay, I'll just take for granted since you're all muted. Um, the son is, is Jesus. He's beginning to unveil the messianic secret. It's getting close to that time. Uh, often the son was a figure for Israel, even in similar storylines. So it doesn't give it away completely, but the vineyard itself is supposed to be Israel. So uh, based on the allusion to Isaiah. So he's hinting, there's gonna be reasons why the high priest is gonna ask if you're, if you're the son of the, of the blessed one. Uh, Bart Ehrman has suggested it and may, may well be right that that's one of the things that Judas betrayed was um, the inner circle's knowledge of who Jesus was. But Jesus is starting to give public hints. Jack Kingsbury points that out at this parable. Israel's leaders are headed for judgment. All ancient law would have sided with the landlord. I mean, ancient law favored the rich anyway, but most poor people would have also sided with the landlord in this story because, you know, whoa, wish I had a landlord who was that nice. But anyway, um, Psalm 118 may suggest, because Jesus quotes about the, the cornerstone, it may suggest the image of a new temple as, as in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was part of the Hillel, it was relevant at Passover, and the Jewish hermeneutical principle, Gezerah Shavah, which some have traced back to Hillel, we don't know, it actually goes back to Hillel, but it may, be, may well be earlier than Hillel. Actually, you have a similar hermeneutic applied sometimes in Greek thinking, but anyway, Gezerah Shavah, linking together texts based on common key wording or ideas, uh, linking it with the crushing stone of Daniel 2.44, like you have in, in Matthew 21. Uh, the crushing stone of Daniel 2.44 was God's kingdom. The stumbling stone of Isaiah 8 and 28, if you don't believe, you'll stumble over him and you'll be put to shame. And these texts were linked with the cornerstone text very early in Christian teaching. You have them linked in, in Romans 9. You have them linked in 1 Peter 2. Uh, there's a good possibility that the linkage goes back before Peter and before Paul, goes back to Jesus himself. Well, in 1210, haven't you read this scripture? That's a real insult to them, by the way, because surely they've read it. I mean, It'd be like saying to, to doctoral students, haven't you read, uh, well, doctoral students in Bible, it would be like saying, haven't you read something by N.T. Wright? Haven't you read something by E.P. Sanders? Haven't you read something by uh, Matthew Robinson? That's, uh, those of you who don't or aren't familiar with Matthew Robinson, he hasn't written anything yet, but when he does, you ought to read it. Uh, this is one of my students in my class. So anyway, the new temple, Mark 12, 10. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Matthew 13, not one stone will be left in another. 13, 14, um, desolating sacrilege. And then again, he's accused of saying he's gonna destroy the temple. In which temple will you invest your hopes? The massive Herodian temple of stone that many people thought was invulnerable. I mean, some of these massive stones in the Jerusalem temple are larger than the stones in the pyramids at Giza. I mean, this is a, this, this, this was like one of the greatest monuments in the ancient world. The temple of Artemis of Ephesus made the seven wonders of the ancient world, but it wasn't as large as the Jerusalem temple. I think they were just anti-Semitic. That's why they didn't include the Jerusalem temple, or maybe it goes back before uh, Herod was uh, laid the, the groundwork for it. But it was massive, most massive temple in the ancient world. In which temple will you build your hopes? The massive Herodian temple of stone or the promised Messiah the rejected cornerstone, rejected by the builders. They're like, we control the temple. Who is this upstart who's challenging us? He was God's son. 
uh, <clears throat> all the elites in Jerusalem confront Jesus in Mark chapter 12 and parallels. So you have the Pharisees and the Herodians, you have the Sadducees. More graciously, you have a Torah expert. So finally, we have a, a nice scribe in this gospel uh, speaking on behalf of his fellow Pharisees, but he's, he's nice. And finally, G Jesus challenges his challengers with a riddle in, in 1235 to 37. And that leads into Jesus' denunciation of the scribes and the Torah experts in 1238 to 40, in contrast with the praise of a poor widow in 1241 to 44. And then he teaches his disciples, well, actually, he says something even before his disciples ask him privately on the Temple Mount. Um, as he's leaving the temple, he says it. This is probably how people overheard it and misinterpreted it. Um, he says, this, this temple is going to be destroyed, chapter 13. Okay, I'm going to, well, we'll see how far we get. Render to Caesar what's Caesar's. Yeah. Should I say something about that? Um, I think it goes back to Augustine, the idea that um, we are made in the image of God. So this coin has Caesar's image, give it to Caesar. We bear God's image, give yourself to God. And Jesus tells this parable right after the, well, not this parable, Jesus is, is challenged about, uh, should we pay taxes to Caesar? He's already said that the produce needs to be rendered to the owner of the vineyard, self-evidently God. And so they're thinking, well, maybe he holds like the, the fourth philosophy. Maybe he's like these people who say, okay, uh, God alone is king. So no more taxes to, to the Roman government. That's not where he's gonna come out. He's going to come out by saying, look, who cares about mammon? <laughs> this is just mammon. This, this, this is Caesar's issue. Give it back to him. This, this by the way, was um, not the money used for the uh, temple. But this, uh, that was, uh, yeah, that was what bore the image of Melkart. But this is a denarius, which somebody has on them. Obviously, they don't object to that coinage bearing uh, an image. And the people in the temple didn't, bear, didn't mind it since, you know, the temple tax and stuff, they're using the image of Melkart. So anyway, uh, Jesus isn't against paying taxes. He's just saying, this is just mammon. Let him have it. You give God yourself. That's what belongs to God. And maybe pure purity in the, in the temple. God of the living rather than God of the dead. I can't really go through all these in detail because it's going to take too long. But their ignorance of scripture and of God's power. God is able to create bodies that don't need marriage. Sadducees had to believe in angels. They appear in the Torah. God creates angels directly. So there's no need for angels to procreate to keep making more angels. Jesus says, well, you see, God can do that. And you should know that from scripture. So, you, you know, resurrection bodies will be like angelic bodies. They won't need to procreate. So you guys are ignorant of the way God can do things. And actually the resurrection bodies in Daniel chapter 12 are compared to something like stars, like, like luminaries in the, in the heavens. And resurrection bodies, Paul compares them to heavenly bodies in 1 Corinthians 15. The stars were often thought to be made of fire. Angels were often thought to be made of fire. Jewish people considered stars to be angels. Gentiles considered them to be divine uh, deities or heroes, so on. Uh, Romans sometimes spoke of astral immortality, although Franz Kamat carried that way too far. But, um, you know, there, there'll be 
bodies, but they won't be the kind of bodies that we're used to now. And Sadducees should have been honest about, you know, there were different people who believed in and affirmed the resurrection had different conceptions of what it would be like exactly. So God remains the God of the patriarchs in Moses's day. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, there's no, the verb doesn't tell you that, but uh, it, it signifies an afterlife. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. The Pharisees affirmed the afterlife and the resurrection. Sadducees denied both. Loving God and neighbor. This is where the nice scribe comes in. Which commandment is the first of all? Well, it could be a test like the divorce question, but like the divorce question, it was also just a common question that was debated among schools of, of Pharisees. Uh, Hillelites, uh, Shemites. The most common answer that was given to this question, attested also in Josephus, the greatest commandment is honor your father and mother. Well, Jesus values honoring your father and your mother. But uh, he's going to say something greater than that. It's not one of the, the Ten Commandments. Instead, he picks something that summarizes the heart of what the law is about. Because if you really love God and love your neighbor, you're going to fulfill all the rest of the law. Later, Rabbi Akiba said that the greatest commandment was love your neighbor. So he came close. I've run down Akiba sometimes, especially when we're talking about Mark chapter 10. Didn't agree with him on divorce, right? But, um, but he came closer on that one. Jesus starts with the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohim Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy 6.4. The context of it is keep all the commandments. That's what, that's what comes before it. And you have that theme running through Deuteronomy. Uh, loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways. If his commandments are written in your heart, you'll, you'll walk in his ways. And it goes on uh, after the Shema to speak of having these commands on your heart. And, and you, uh, you post them on your doorpost and you know, so, so you see them everywhere and on your, on, your, on your forehead and your hands so you don't forget them. That maybe was figurative, but was practiced literally in this period. You speak of his words when you're at home and on the way, when you lie down and you rise up, a good Hebrew way of saying, you know, just like heavens and earth are meant to encompass everything uh, at home and on the way, meant to encompass wherever you are, lie down and rise up whenever you are doing it. Love God with all your being, he says. And that's a theme in Deuteronomy. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip that. Um, with all your heart, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip that. <laughs> um, with all your soul or your life, your psuche, Jesus has already talked about being willing to lay down your life. Later, Rabbi Akiba, it's said that when he was being flayed alive as a martyr for the Torah, uh, He's reciting the Shema and says, okay, now I understand what it means to love God with my whole nefesh, my whole life. In Greek, my whole psuche. And all your mind, which overlaps with heart. And uh, again, we have understanding a lot in Mark's gospel. And, and love your neighbor as yourself. The, the scribe had technically asked him, Poya, what kind of commandment is the greatest? And Jesus answers with the first and the second commandment that are the same kind of commandment. He answers with love. Well, it was natural, uh, remembering Gezer Shavah, it's natural to join these two commandments. They both begin with the same wording in Hebrew. Avaya hafta, you shall love. Leviticus 19.18, after a list of particulars, Leviticus gets general in Leviticus 19.17 to 19a, including you shall not take vengeance, remember that forgiveness, or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, you shall keep my statutes. Again, the, the summary. 
Jesus applies this beyond one's own people in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37, where a scribe there asks him uh, the greatest commandment and, um, and says, okay, love your neighbor as yourself. The scribe agrees, that's what the scribe says. And so Jesus says, yes. Now, uh, you wanna know who your neighbor is? Well, your neighbor may be somebody you don't like, like the Samaritans. He says that by means of a parable, but it should be obvious to the scribe who knows the Torah because later on in chapter 19, the foreigner who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the foreigner as yourself for you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. Um, don't wanna get into politics here, but in terms of loving our neighbor as ourself, if that doesn't include the immigrant, maybe we're not even saved. Sorry, maybe I should be quiet. Oh, I, I'm, I'm being too controversial, let me go on. Okay, so Matthew twenty-two forty. 40. Okay, let me not tie it to soteriology. Let me just say, um, that's the second commandment in there. We ought to obey it. Um, Matthew twenty two forty adds to this, but I think authentically from real memory, on these commandments hang the whole law and the prophets. In, in rabbinic tradition, although the, the source of this is significantly later, uh, significantly later than Hillel also, but traditionally Hillel had said this before the time of Jesus, uh, not, not for these commandments, but on what Jesus says also in Matthew chapter seven, Hillel says, don't do to your neighbor what you don't want them to do to you. That's the whole of the law and the prophets. Jesus probably said that uh, with that, he, and he probably said it with this as well, because uh, that this is regarded as the fulfillment of the law by Paul in Romans 13 and in Galatians 5, and it's also uh, the fulfillment of the law in James. So anyway, how we prioritize text reveals or undergirds our hermeneutical sieve. And what Jesus offers is a hermeneutic of absolute devotion to God and to people made in God's image. And it's informed by the sorts of particulars we have in the New Testament. Sexual ethics are maintained Ritual ethics are loosened, but love is the heart of what God is about. And if we miss that, we've missed everything. David's son or David's Lord? Yeah, if we miss that, we are like, not like the nice scribe, we're like the scribes who opposed to Jesus, who thought they knew so much, but they missed the heart of what he was talking about. David's son or David's Lord. This is probably an antimony and I'm going to skip that except to say it could be both. The point of the question is it's a riddle. How do you reconcile these two, these two ideas? And then scribes versus widows. So you had some people that were using their religious position to exploit other people. Today, we have all sorts of scandals that the media have unearthed, and thank God that the media unearthed them. Somebody needs to do it. It's unfortunate, though, when people get the idea that this is all of religion, and that's, uh, yeah, that's not appropriate. But we have all these scandals of, of religious people exploiting other people in the name of religion. Jesus challenges that in his own day. Coming judgment, we need to be ready for it, Mark 13. Impending judgment on the religious establishment at the first coming, that would be the temple. And um, yeah, for us, that's something we can look back on. Second coming, well, we need to be ready for that, the second coming too. I guess we are part of the religious establishment of the second coming as Bible teachers or, or whatever we are uh, in the service of the Lord. And we need to make sure to learn the lesson from the religious establishment the first time around. We need to remember we are the caretakers. 
he is the Lord. Does Mark know the difference between the first coming, I'm uh, sorry, between the, the destruction of the temple and the second coming? On my view, th this is again, very debated among scholars. So not everybody holds this view. I think I, think I remember both, uh, both, well, I was gonna say both of the major, there's actually a bunch of major ones, but uh, Adela Yarbrough Collins, Joel Marcus, I, I think they all dated after 70. I may be wrong on one of them, uh, but uh, there seems to be a trend of a lot of scholars dating it after 70 now, but there's, there's still considerable debate on this. I think that Mark is writing before 70. And so he sees both as eschatological, as part of the future together, doesn't know that there's gonna be a distinction chronologically. Um, Matthew and Luke, I think, write after 70 and thus clarify it. So you have two different questions. Matthew 24, uh, abomination of desolation and Luke becomes Jerusalem being surrounded by armies. Uh, but are they gonna have cognitive dissonance once the temple's destroyed and Jesus hasn't come back yet? Uh, and you may have people saying, he has come back, he's here, or he's there. Now wait till it's like lightning from one end of the sky to the other. Do they have a lot of cognitive dissonance and have to explain it away? Actually, maybe a little bit of cognitive dissonance, but maybe not as much as we would expect because it already fits the Old Testament prophetic model. God's promises unfold in stages. Hey, by this time, they already know there's a first coming and a second coming. So they already know that it can unfold in stages, the eschatological restoration. Um, and you have that, I mean, Old Testament prophets saying the day of Yahweh is coming soon. You better get ready. It's, it's just around the corner. <laughs> saying that in the time of Isaiah and Amos, saying it a hundred years later in the time of Jeremiah, saying it, you know, keep saying it. By this time, this has been going on for 700 years. People are probably used to prophetic rhetoric at this point. But anyway, not one stone upon another. Uh, yeah, these stones were massive. This was just huge. Uh, Jesus earlier overturned the tables, predicting what was coming, uh, greater judgment coming. He challenges the authorities in the temple in chapter 12. And then he, he challenges the religious establishment even, even more graphically, where he's contrasting them with the scribes. And then gets more explicit about the temple's destruction. He says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. What generation, to what generation does he refer? Well, elsewhere in Mark, he's referring to the generation that was then living. And by biblical standards, that gives about 40 years, which is about right from 30 to 70. You don't have to be a math major to figure that one out. The temple was destroyed almost exactly 40 years after Jesus predicted it. And you also have that in Q and elsewhere um, about your house being left too desolate. Whenever Israel sinned, God allowed the temple's destruction and or desecration. Happened under Antiochus Epiphanes, happened with the Babylonians, and it happens in the first century. And if it ever gets rebuilt, it could happen again. The prediction is surely authentic, it's multiply attested. It's coherent with Jesus' act of judgment, the uh, distorted testimony that's given against Jesus, the Q material like the house being being left desolate, um, the uh, the distorted testimony. In the, you also have it in a different way in Acts six, and seems to also reflect the kind of thing Jesus says in John two. Jewish Christians continued to worship in the temple. They would not have created a saying like this. There were also some other people who did believe judgment was coming in the temple. So I mean, Jesus isn't the only one who, who said something like that. Joshua ben Hananiah, admittedly a generation later than Jesus, but before the temple was destroyed. You also have it in Testament of Levi. I think that may be, um, that may be a Christian interpolation there, I'm not sure. But the Testament of Moses, probably 
pre-Christian or at least non-Christian, pre-Temple's destruction talks about it. And uh, there were plenty of people expecting God to bring about a new temple, especially in sectarian Judaism, but you already had it in the, probably already, I say, in the Amida. Um, Qumran, the Kittim will carry off Jerusalem priesthood's wealth, so on. Now, there's probably an element of hyperbole in it. There were some stones left on others, although they're in the retaining wall, so it depends on whether you count that. It omits the destruction by fire, which Josephus really highlights as the main force of destruction. Um, so probably not a prophecy after the event. It probably reflects something Jesus really said. It uses a lot of the language of Old Testament prophets. And even after the temple was destroyed though, later rabbis attributed the destruction to God's judgment on Jerusalem. Boy, I'm running short on time. In this context, he says to flee when you see the desecration that leads to destruction. Well, in the year 66, Judean revolutionaries slaughtered the priests in the temple and installed their own mock priest. Josephus thinks this is the abomination that later led to destruction. The temple was destroyed three and a half years later. Um, there are also other interpretations of it. W one of the main interpretations is, you know, they actually worship Caesar. They worship the standards bearing Caesar's image on the site of the temple after its destruction in the year 70. Now that certainly is an abomination and it also matches the destruction. The problem with that is it's too late to flee at that point, you're already dead. So, or enslaved. Jesus says to flee immediately. So it's off, well, there, there are other views. Sometimes it's made to be completely future. Uh, but anyway, if it's referring to 66, well, even if it's not, Jesus says to flee immediately. Uh, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Jerusalem was in the hill country, but yeah, well, that means the, the mountains they were to flee into would be close by. David and the Maccabees conducted guerrilla warfare or fleeing in the mountains. So you could um, get away from your enemy more easily there, especially on the, on the narrow mountain paths. So you could actually throw down rocks on your enemies. Their numbers wouldn't count for them. They could only get up one person at a time. Jesus was emphatic about haste. Uh, people had flat roofs. So if you were coming down from the, the roof uh, and getting away, you wouldn't have to enter back into your house. You, you could just flee. Um, <clears throat> let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. It was cool when workers began at sunrise by midday, they'd leave their cloak at the edge of the field. This, for poor workers, this was their blanket and their bedroll at night. Jesus says, leave it. Your life matters more than your possessions. So it's probably hyperbolic, but it's emphasizing urgency. Refugees often have to flee very quickly from the place where they're at. Um, and this was my wife, Nadine, after her first bout of being a refugee and before her 18 month bout of being a refugee, uh, when uh, Medine's brother is now passed away, was pushing their father who's now passed away in a wheelbarrow as they tried to escape. Woe to those who are pregnant or nursing during that time. Medine actually was nursing. And when she saw the pregnant women struggling, oh, her heart went out to them. People are more susceptible to the death at that time. They're also more susceptible to mourning. Josephus says that some of those, um, they lost their children during the siege of Jerusalem. Some of them killed their children and ate them. Something that Deuteronomy 28 talked about. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter. Winter was difficult for travel, even for armies, especially in the sometimes snowy Judean hills. Rivers flooded during winter, rainy season, and became hard to cross. 
you also had wadi, dr dry creek beds that would flood with water uh, during uh, the, the heavy rains and afterwards. In fact, the Romans captured and slaughtered a large group of refugees trapped at the overflowing Jordan. Uh, this, at this point, not in the winter, but in the spring. Haste really was important. Immediacy might be hyperbolic, but Jesus really intended swiftness. After the spring of 68, refugees, fugitives, couldn't even surrender to the Romans, even if they escaped from the walls of Jerusalem. Because word got around among the Syrian recruits that some of the Judean refugees had swallowed jewels so they'd have some money uh, after they escaped. They'd get them out in their next bowel movement. Uh, I don't want to think about what that does to your insides, but once word got around, the Syrian auxiliaries, whenever the, they'd capture Judean fugitives from Jerusalem, they'd hold them down take a sword, cut them open to see if they had any jewels inside of them. Jerusalem's Christians, however, according to Eusebius, had, had fled safely to Pella. In 70, Romans erected standards that, that bore the insignia of the, the emperor on the side of the temple. Now the Dead Sea Scrolls call these standards idols. And Josephus tells us that when Pilate brought these into Jerusalem uh, early in his governorship, Jer that, that Jerusalemites traveled to Caesarea to protest. He said, look, you back down, I'm gonna kill you. And they threw themselves before him and they said, kill us all before you contaminate our holy city with these standards. But in the year 70, it happened. And Jerusalemites were carried off into slavery. The survivors were. Jesus speaks of, oh, that's the Methian reference. Jesus speaks of tribulation like never before, uh, using the language of Daniel chapter 12. But in intolerable tribulation, God has compassion in his own. But when he really comes, even the sky is going to declare it. And I'd love to go into more detail on that, but I can't really do that right now. But it doesn't leave much of a room for a pre tribulation rapture, in my opinion. But again, that's debated in different circles than debate the historicity stuff that is debated that I've mentioned and some other things. But, uh, but besides the events fulfilled in the year 70, Jesus also gave some non-signs, some things where Jesus says, you'll see these things. These are just the beginning of birth pangs. The end is not yet. False prophets, wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes. These have been going on for a long time. Uh, they'll still be going on, but they've already been going on for a long time. And persecution. Um, yeah, the end is not yet. The end is still to come. By contrast, he lists one prerequisite for the end. The good news must be preached among all the nations. So if we're looking forward to Jesus coming back. We have our work cut out for us, right? Paul applies Jesus' end time teachings already in First and Second Thessalonians. Uh, I do believe Second Thessalonians to be authentic. I don't see why anybody after the temple was destroyed would go around talking about somebody seating himself in the temple. Um, so, uh, but these, both of these letters echo Jesus' teachings about um, the future, the, the, uh, the temple, and especially Jesus coming on the clouds, gathering together as elect, uh, sound of a trumpet you have in Matthew, you don't have it in Mark. Coming like a thief in the night, you have it in Q. Paul was clearly referring to Jesus' teachings. The classic rapture passage, it seems to me, is talking about Jesus coming after the tribulation at the end of the age. Um, and it also attests that these are early sayings. So let me go on. Nobody knows the hour. A lot of people have thought they knew the, the day and the hour. Um, they've always had one thing in common. They've always been wrong. I'd, I'd love to go into more detail in this. Uh, I know, Matthew, you did the thing with Tim, Tim Gedert's work on, on watchwords, but uh, I'm gonna have to skip this so I can say something about uh, Mark 14. 
Uh, you have the woman versus the male disciples in contrast with Judas, the, the question of how much Jesus is worth. Judas is an example of somebody who follows Jesus for what they can get out of him. And as people are becoming disciples of Jesus today, they need to get beyond the point of just following Jesus for what they can get out of him and following Jesus because he's Lord. Um, otherwise, they may not persevere when hard times come and they're not getting out of them what they want. Uh, the woman contrasts with Jesus' enemies. And you have the chart. I won't go through all the details. Um, the perfume flasks. Uh, yeah, preparing the Passover. I really need to skip this. Skip the other uh, uh, upper city. <laughs> and just say, you know, the upper room. There were a lot of places that had upper rooms. Especially the bigger homes were more likely to have upper rooms in Jerusalem. The bigger homes especially if you could get all the disciples in there, this is probably in the upper city of Jerusalem. Lower city downwind of the sewers, that was where most Jerusalemites lived. Upper city, the, they had wealthier homes, palatial mansion, um, Herod's uh, palace. Of course, the, the Temple Mount is Joining that, well, you can get the Temple Mount either way. There were a couple ways to get into it, but the triclinia in late Roman period houses, uh, you, you actually find this in uh, Hirschfeld archaeologically shows that you find triclinia in Jewish homes. So they could be reclining on couches if it's a well to do home. If not, they could be reclining on drugs. Uh, rugs around the floor, but they could be reclining in normal reclining fashion. So that's why you can have uh, the beloved disciple in John 19, I'm oh, sorry, John 13, 23, leaning his head back on Jesus' breast because you'd have uh, the people ranged like sardines, one person here, one person here, one person there, three to four people per, per couch or rug if that's all they had. Um, these are some pictures of some house plans of excavated homes with triclinia and yeah, reclining postures at banquets. The Last Supper, the final passion prediction. Oh boy, this is probably, uh, I'm not gonna get to the crucifixion. So it would be at least nice if I could say something about this. Multiply attested, it's attested also in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul received it and delivered it. Um, People say, ah, he says he received it and received it from the Lord. Well, the rabbis uh, in, the, in the Mishnah often said they received something from Sinai. It didn't mean directly, it could mean indirectly. But anyway, um, uh, Jeremias does a lot on this. And uh, Joel Marcus has done something on the Passover relationship with it. The, the most uh, thorough and recent work that goes beyond. Um, Beyond Jeremias, uh, spelled like Jeremias, is Brant Petrie's work, P-I-T-R-E. I highly recommend it. A good, really good Catholic scholar on that. Uh, now, as for it being his literal body and blood, uh, I think because it's a Passover context, we may not want to read into it too much. This is the bread of affliction that our ancestors ate when they came out of the land of Egypt. They didn't mean that literally, that it was the same bread that their ancestors ate when they came out of the land of Egypt. So we shouldn't read too much into this either because uh, it would be really stale and already chewed up if it was the same thing. Um, his disciples let him down, the betrayal, uh, uh, the guy who runs, leaves his cloak behind. Uh, I, I can't, uh, I'm out of time, just, Jesus got crucified, his disciples abandoned him and fled. And in chapter 16, the women who are the, the ones who stuck with him to the end after his disciples abandoned him, they stuck with him to the cross. Uh, they're introduced as main characters finally at that point, even though they've been with him the whole time, Mark says, uh, he introduces the, the women there because the male disciples have fled, so the women have to be the witnesses now. And 
They follow him to the, to the tomb. And then they find out he's risen from the dead. And just like people get shocked at Jesus' miracles, just like people sometimes are afraid at Jesus' miracles, it says they ran off and they didn't tell anybody. So the male disciples have already failed. Now the women disciples fail. Everybody failed except the one hero, Jesus, look to him. And I can imagine Peter, even though I haven't gone into my arguments for why Peter is, stands behind the tradition of Mark here, um, I can imagine Peter telling the story like, you know, you, you all think I'm so great that I'm the chief apostle, you know, this leader in the church decades after all this, but really this isn't a story about me. This is a story about Jesus. He's the real hero. The rest of us, we all failed. We all failed him. But we're not going to fail him again. And maybe by the time Mark wrote, Peter had actually been martyred. And everybody knew that Peter didn't fail him that time. Um, Mark doesn't go into the resurrection appearances, but he predicts them. And Jesus' predictions that could be fulfilled within the gospel narrative were fulfilled within the narrative. So you know the other ones will be fulfilled. The resurrection appearances um, didn't, it wasn't a problem for Mark to leave it out. There was no rule yet that gospels had to conclude with resurrection appearances. But, you know, afterwards, the other gospel writers uh, included those. But we know that they happened from 1 Corinthians 15 and, and so on. Uh, but we also know Jesus predicted the temple's destruction, that was going to happen. We can look back on those things having happened, and therefore we can trust him for the other thing. Jesus died. Jesus rose. Jesus will come again. Maranatha, come our Lord. Amen. Who would close us in prayer. This is the final prayer of the semester. So I, I mean, I already said Maranatha, but does anybody else want uh, to, or we can, we can count that then. Our Lord come and may we be found faithful when the son of man comes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.